is that painting? Okay, I was planning on showing a whole bunch of cool artwork, but I guess not. That just happens sometimes. You can't rely on this technology. The more complicated some gets, the more there are more moving parts to break. That's how I look at it. Okay, right, so today we are going to talk about demonic possession. And I was wanting to ask our kids, you know, what do you, what do you think of the scripture that we read today? Nick, what do you think of the scripture? Yeah, it's a powerful story. You know, it's not something that we, we talk about quite a bit. You know, I wanted to tell the kids today, you know, whenever you're afraid of evil, all you have to do is call upon the name and power of Jesus Christ. You know, there's a lot of things that are going on in our world that are really scary. And um, I'm scared too. Fear is a normal reaction to that. Um, but the good news is that Jesus Christ is more powerful than all of these forces that we see in this world. So when you get scared... I want you to call upon the name of Jesus Christ, and those unclean spirits are commanded to get away from you and, and to depart. That's the good news. You know, this is not something that gets a lot of airtime in our churches for a number of reasons. You know, it wouldn't be a stretch to say that most of us no longer believe in demonic possession these days. You know, it's hard to have a serious discussion about it because it's been so sensationalized. You know, most of what we think we know about demonic possession comes to us from Hollywood. You know, in, in 1973, we were frightened by a movie called The Exorcist. Anybody ever seen that movie? I saw that movie. I, I don't recommend it. If you haven't seen it, don't go out and watch it because there's just some things that you can't unsee. And that's not a good thing, you know, but that's where a lot of our imagery comes from. The rest of our imagery comes from a combination of the Bible and Italian literature, namely Dante's Inferno. There was another book called Milton's Paradise Lost. So most of our imagery, most of our uh, understanding of demonic possession doesn't come from the Bible. It's actually come to us from a number of other sources. You know, now freaking out about evil is not a new thing. You know, I remember when I was a kid in Enid, Oklahoma, our parents were freaking out about this game called Dungeons and Dragons. You remember that? I remember that, you know. Out of all of the evil going on in the world, they focused their anxiety on a bunch of kids playing board games. You know, overall, it was really confusing. We were told that it was evil, but we were never really told why it was evil. You know, I never played the games, but of course, since it was forbidden, I had to go look it up. We had a local bookstore, so I would just go in there and read the book and then leave without paying for it. You know, I actually did that quite a bit. I was a bad book mooch, you know, back in the 80s. You know, that's, that's kind of how I started my reading career. You know, I looked at the Dungeons and Dragons, and there was nothing sinister about it, you know, but our parents were all worked up about it. That's why we weren't allowed to play it. They even came out with a Dungeons and Dragons cartoon, and it was, oh no, you can't watch that because you're going to, that will allow the evil spirits to come into your soul and, and take over your, your, uh, your, your body. And that's how you lose your eternal salvation. You know, but that wasn't the end of our freaking out about evil. Here we were in northern Oklahoma, and I will never forget when the rumors went around about a new horrible evil that was stalking children. Now, I kid you not, we were told that there, were a, there was a secret group of ninjas that had infiltrated the town. And then the story was is that these ninjas had sacrificed a baby in Houston, Texas, of all places, and now the terror was headed north. You know, that's what some people believe, you know. I mean, I'm not a big fan of Houston, but it's not that bad. <laughs> no, that wasn't the end of our freaking out about evil. You know, I remember, uh, you know, after that it was heavy metal. Yeah, there was a, does anybody, does anybody remember the trial for Judas Priests? Now, it, it is a bad name for a band. I mean, I, I will say that. It was this heavy metal band back in the 80s. You ever heard that song, Breaking the Law? Breaking the Law, Breaking the Law. That, that was Judas Priest. You know, they, you see it in movies all the time. Now, they were, they were being sued for supposedly having subliminal messages on their albums. The prosecution was alleging that there were evil messages if the music was played backwards. You know, I remember watching a part of the trial, and I, I actually listened. I wanted to hear the subliminal messages for myself. You want to know what I heard? 
It said, do you have a peppermint? Yes, I think I have one. <laughs> That's exactly what I heard on the subliminal messages. Do you have a peppermint? You know, I, I, I once went through this phase where I studied everything that I could find about possession and exorcism. You know, I've never been called upon to exorcise a person. I would never do that. I'm not trained to do that. I have been called upon to exorcise a place. That's actually, you'd be surprised at how often that pops up. It happens all the time. You know, it, it's hard to find some serious scholarship on this because there's not a lot out there. You know, the best stuff was the training materials that they used to train Roman Catholic priests. They're about the only ones who are studying this kind of stuff in any kind of systematic way. I learned about the stages of demonic possession. And then I also learned about the stages of the exorcism rite. Both, both of them go through kind of a, a predictable cadence, a sequence of events. You know, it starts when a person becomes aware of another personality inside of their own consciousness. And then they start to communicate with this personality. They develop a relationship with it. Then they start making deals. And then they finally succumb and submit their will to this other personality inside of them. You know, the first question we have is, is, is whether or not it's actually possible to be possessed by demons. You know, I think that it is. If we can be possessed by the Holy Spirit, then it's not unreasonable to believe that we can be possessed by an unclean spirit as well. So let's take a look at our scripture. I hope this works. I hope this works. I've worked, I've worked 10 hours trying to get this computer thing to do what I wanted to do. All right, here we go. And so they were blamed for all of society's problems. 
They were labeled as evil, and, the, and, and what resulted was the most terrifying display of human violence that we have seen in modern times. You know, when I studied this episode of history, I realized that groups of people can be possessed by evil, and it happens in predictable stages. And so in my research, I've been able to identify three stages of demonic possession where groups of people fall under the spell of evil. Now, the first stage of demonic possession is fear. And there's an important reason for this. In the 1960s, there was a neuroscientist named McLean, and he figured out that our brains have three major parts. Uh, number, the first part of the brain is the reptilian brain. The second part is the limbic system. The third part is the neocortex. Now, the reptilian brain is the most primitive part of our brains, and it's responsible for our survival. When we're chased by a saber-toothed tiger, we experience fight or flight. Our brains go on autopilot, and we fight our way out of the situation, or we run away from it. Now, the thinking part of our brain is called the neocortex. This is where we experience rational thought, creativity, imagination. Now here's the problem. Here's the problem. When we become afraid, our primitive brain takes over and it overrides our neocortex. You can't use both parts of the brain at the same time. When fear takes over, rational thought and creativity become impossible. Now this is useful if you're being chased by a huge alligator or by a, a tribe of you know, wild baboons, you know, wanting to rip you apart. You know, it's not so useful when we're living in complex societies. So that's the first stage of demonic possession. When we become afraid, our primitive brain takes over and it wipes out our ability to think clearly. There's a famous piece of literature that depicts this uh, conflict between our primitive brain and our thinking brain. It's called The Strange Case of Dr. Jekyll and Mr. Hyde. Has anybody ever read that book? You're probably forced to read it when you're back in, when you're back in high school. It shows the existence of a monster and a creative scientist within the same person. The primitive brain and the thinking brain are at war within the same personality. This story is a reminder that our conscious minds do not eliminate our primitive instincts. FDR has some insight into this. At his inauguration as president, Franklin Delano Roosevelt told the nation, he said, we have nothing to fear but fear itself. This is some profound wisdom from one of our greatest presidents. Now notice what he's saying. He's not saying that we shouldn't be afraid. We should be afraid. He's saying that we should be afraid of the right things. Our enemies are not flesh and blood. It's fear itself. That's what we should be afraid of. It destroys our nation because it short circuits our thinking apparatus. Fear itself is what we should be afraid of because it unleashes a terrible, destructive power. Fear causes us to revert back to our more primitive state. But that's not the whole story. That is only the first stage of demonic possession. There's two other stages before demonic possession is complete. The second stage of possession is called projection. This dynamic was outlined by a Swiss psychologist named Carl Jung. He taught us about a part of our personality called the shadow. Our shadow contains all of the things that we don't like about ourselves, but we are unable to acknowledge. When a person is not in touch with their dark side, and when they're not learning more about it, all of these, excuse me, when it, Excuse me. When a person is not in touch with their dark side, they do something that's very frightening. With this. Instead of their instead of accepting their dark side, it is what it is, and learning to to uh, learning more about it, they project it onto others. You know, so all the things that we don't like about other people, all of those things that get on your nerves, these are some very important clues about your own personality. It's usually things that you don't like about yourself that you're unable to deal with. Try it sometime. Next time something really gets on your nerves, just take a hard look at yourself and you realize, I'm doing the exact same thing. That's why it pushes such a, such a big reaction from us. We're projecting our shadow onto other people. You know, it's things that we don't like about ourselves, but we're unable to deal with them. That's why it's so easy to see sin in others, but it's so hard to see the sin within ourselves. Have you ever noticed that? 
It is so easy to see other people's shortcomings and hypocrisies, but it is extremely difficult to see our own. Other people's faults are crystal clear. Oh yeah, we can see that under a microscope, but our own faults are much harder to see. When we project our shadow onto other people, we see, other, we see ourselves as good and other people as bad. We point a finger at other people and we accuse them of our very own sins. That's why the second stage of possession is polarizing division. We see ourselves as totally good. We see our enemies as totally evil. We demonize other people because we are unable to take a realistic look at ourselves. When we project our own evil onto others, they are dehumanized. And when they are dehumanized, the stage is set for atrocity. That's the problem with war. In every single conflict, each side sees the other as the embodiment of pure evil. Everybody sees themselves as an agent of good, and the other side is the embodiment of Satan. That's how war works. That's just war. You know, so the first stage of possession is fear. Our primitive brain takes over. We're no longer able to think rationally. The second stage is projection. We point the finger. We accuse other people of our own sins. The result is that we see ourselves as totally good. We see the other people as totally evil. So these are the first two stages. Now once you get to this point, you're almost there. You're on your way. But you're not quite completely possessed. There's still one more stage to go. The third stage of demonic possession is obedience to authority. In the 1960s, there was a famous set of experiments by a guy named Stanley Milgram at Yale. He was a researcher, and he set, up a, he set up this test. He wanted to test people's reaction to authority figures. They told the, the, the participants that it was, a, it, was a, it was supposed to study how people learn. And so they, they set up this table, with a whole bunch of electronic gadgets on it. And one of the gadgets was a shocker that would shock the person in the next room. The other person in the other room was an actor, so nobody actually got hurt. You know, well, they had this guy in the room with a lab coat on, and every time the, uh, the person in the other room got an answer wrong, the subject was told to administer an electric shock. And after every wrong answer, the shocks increased in intensity over time. And as the voltage increased, the actor started crying out in pain. And after the strongest shocks, he started screaming and hollering about a heart condition. And so some people were like, oh, no, I'm worried about this. But the person in the lab coat said, you know, well, but the test says you've got to do it. Um, you know, the most, at this point, most, a lot of the people were uncomfortable. But the guy, the guy in the lab coat kept telling them to shock the other person. And do you want to know how many people took it all the way, even after hearing the guy scream about his heart condition? It was 65%. 65%. They originally thought that they were going to get like 1% or 2% of people who would go all the way with it. 65% of people went all the way. That means that 65% of people in this room would torture another person if, another, if an authority figure tells us to do so. And this was just a guy in a lab coat. What happens when it's a, uh, a, a politician? What happens when it's a religious leader? What happens when it's a parent? The result of this three-stage possession process is totally predictable. We become afraid. We label other people as evil. And then we submit to an authority figure that commands us to hurt other human beings. The sad thing is, is that most people will obey. And this is the result. You know, right now we're dealing with the aftermath of a horrible tragedy in Orlando, Florida. I remember we heard about it on last Sunday morning, um, you know, right when we were coming to church. And, and I've been thinking about this a lot this week. It's been hard to think about anything else. A shooter named Omar Mateen entered into a gay and lesbian nightclub in Florida, and he turned it into a psycho circus. It's one of the worst tragedies we've seen in a long time. 49 people were killed because of fear and because of hatred. And I remember uh, right after the attack, the accusations started flying immediately. It was because there was a gun. It was because there wasn't a gun. It was inspired by ISIS. 
the shooter's dad got on TV and he, and he said that his son was enraged because he saw two men kissing in Miami. It's Obama's fault. It's Bush's fault. It's Abraham Lincoln's fault. You know, I finally had to turn off the news because it made, it made it really hard for me to figure out what I was feeling in the midst of all of this. You know, you know, in the end, all I can say is that I'm feeling a profound sadness for the lives that were lost. And I feel a profound sadness because I know it's going to keep happening over and over and over again. These were people with loved ones. These were people with families. They had pets waiting for them to come home. The first responders on the scene described what a mass shooting sounds like. You would expect an eerie silence, but that's not what it's like. Instead, what they heard was dozens of cell phones going off all at once. It was their loved ones desperately trying to see if they were, they were okay. And they weren't. Demonic power was unleashed, and it's no coincidence that it happened at a gay nightclub. This is a group of people that has been demonized for a very long time. They've been turned into the other. They have been the recipients of our projection. They have been disrespected. When they're not being abused, they're largely ignored. This club was a safe space for them. And it's no coincidence that this became the site of a profound tragedy. You know, after the attack, all kinds of explanations were being thrown around. But few people bothered to ask the gay and lesbian and transgender community about how they were feeling. There were few people who were asking them, I mean, what does this mean to you? And once again, they were talked about, but not talked to. You know, that's why the most important thing we can do right now is to listen to one another. Blame is always going to be abundant, but listening and compassion are always in short supply. In the face of tragedy, there are no answers. There is only the presence of the answerer. The world is watching the church right now. We are being watched to see what we will do. The, you know, are we going to remain silent? Or are we going to name this evil for what it is? Are we going to stand in solidarity with its victims? The world is watching us and the silence of our churches speaks volumes. As the body of Christ, we are called to name the demon and to cast it out in the name of Jesus Christ. This is what happens when people are demonized. When people are dehumanized, lives are destroyed, lives are lost. And we're called to reflect upon what, is, you know, what does this mean? And I have to point out that the exact same thing happened to Jesus Christ himself. They didn't crucify him because they wanted to make sure that he paid the price for our sins. His tormentors didn't know anything about that. They murdered him because they were convinced that they were ridding the world of some great evil. That's why they killed him. The crowd projected its own evil, its own violence onto the Savior. He literally took upon himself the sins of the world, and he did it willingly to reveal the demonic process for what it actually is. Now I want to read you some responses to the Orlando shooting. Sheikh Abdul Mohammed of the Al-Qaeda Network said, we shouldn't be mourning the death of 50 sodomites. People say, like, well, aren't you sad that 50 sodomites died? Here's the problem with that. It's like the equivalent of asking me, what if you ask me, hey, are you sad that 50 pedophiles were killed today? He said, no, I think it's great. I think it helps society. You know, I think Orlando, Florida is a little safer tonight. Can you believe that anyone can say these things? And then he added, the tragedy is that more of them didn't die. The tragedy is, I'm kind of upset that he didn't finish the job. It's unbelievable. Ishmael Al-Abid of ISIS said, Florida Gay Pulse Club attacked. I'm so happy that someone decided to shoot perverts instead of innocent people. That is what I call an effective shooting. Gays don't deserve to live. Never mind, I'm sorry, I got the attributions for these quotes all wrong. These things were not uttered by Muslim extremists. These things came out of the mouths of Christian pastors. It's hard to believe that people would exploit a tragedy in this way, but they did, and they will continue to do so until Jesus Christ comes back in all of his glory. But I am bound and determined to butt heads with them any time, any place. In this, in this time, Jesus Christ is counting on us to join forces with anybody who is vulnerable. 
We are called to listen to them and to join in solidarity with them in this fight against evil. You know, one of my favorite authors, his name is William Gibson. I wrote a brilliant book called Neuromancer. It's one of my favorite novels. It came out in 82. He said the most dangerous poison is odorless and tasteless. Let's just think about that quote for a little bit. Now, do you think that Satan is going to hand us a drink that tastes nasty? That's not how the devil works. He's crafty. He's going to offer us something that tastes good. He wants us to drink it all, and we do because it tastes good, and it makes us feel powerful. It makes us feel more righteous. It makes us feel a little bit safer, even though it has the opposite effect. But he's a liar. Satan is a deceiver, and he is more powerful than we are. You want to know how tricky Satan is? This is how tricky the devil is. This is crappy. This is smooth. I figured this out, and I was like, wow, this is scary. What happens if we start demonizing the demonizer? What does that make us? That makes us demonizers ourselves. What happens if we get all judgmental of people who are judgmental? What does that make us? It makes us judgmental. My friends, sin has a long and crooked arm. You can't get away from it. You can't free yourself from it. You turn left, it's there. You turn right, it's there. You can't escape it with your own power. And that's what it means to be in chains, to be captive to original sin. It gets a hold of you like a boa constrictor. It wraps itself around you and it slowly starts to squeeze the life out of you and the life out of other people too. And that's why we need Jesus Christ to free us from this bondage because He's the only one who can do it. We are trapped by forces that we can't control. They control us. And the only antidote to evil is for us to become possessed by the power of compassion and the power of love. My friends, this is dangerous stuff. We're afraid of confronting demonic forces in our world because we instinctively know that they're going to come after us too. And it's true. If you confront the forces of evil, you become their next target. That's why so many people stay silent. You confront the forces of evil, you set the stage for your own crucifixion. But nevertheless, Jesus Christ commands us to confront the power of evil in this world. Our enemies are not flesh and blood. Our enemies are the principalities and powers which continue to destroy human lives. These are the forces that are destroying our world. You know, we look down on Nazi Germany, but don't think it can't happen to us. We can argue that it already has. You know, my friends, the only way for us to dispel evil is to invite, is to call upon the presence of Jesus Christ. Exorcism isn't just about banishing the demons. It's about making room in our souls for the power of the Holy Spirit. We can't remove the evil from our own souls, and we are fooled into thinking that we can rid the world of evil by attacking others. We can't. My friends, Jesus Christ is calling on us to reject fear, to own up to the own evil in our own hearts instead of projecting it onto other people. And he's calling on us to reject any leader, any authority that brings out the worst in us instead of the best. Notice what happened to the demoniac in Luke's gospel. Jesus didn't tell him to go out and start casting out demons. That's not what Jesus tells him to do. He told him to go back to his town and spread the good news. To testify to the life of Jesus Christ and to bring other people into the kingdom by telling the world that Jesus Christ has the power over all the demonic forces that, is, that, that are surrounding us. He has power over the evil that is both around us and the evil that is within us. He's the Prince of Peace and he's calling upon his disciples to take a stand. The reality is that we're all in need of an exorcism. Every single last one of us here needs an exorcism. And for the Christian, our exorcism is our baptism. That's where we learn about our true identity. And that's where we get the power to continue Christ's ministry in a broken and hurting world. And as the great parliamentarian Edmund Burke said, the only thing necessary for the triumph of evil is for good people to do nothing. Let us pray. Dear Lord, we come before you today surrounded by frightening forces that, that we can't control. Lord, I pray that you will use us as agents of peace. Lord, I pray that you will use us to build bridges. Use us as agents of, of your kingdom. Lord, I pray that you will teach us how to reconcile 
with the other. Lord, I pray that you will help us to listen to other people. Lord, I pray that you will give us the power to somehow love our enemies because you have loved us even when we were your enemies. Lord, I thank you for this good news. Lord, I thank you for protecting us. And Lord, I pray that you will continue to rain down your Holy Spirit upon us and continue to form us in the image of Jesus Christ so that we may be whole and bring wholeness to this broken and fragmented world. In all these things we pray in his holy and precious name. Amen.